Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And, and I spent a lot of my Saturday uh, evenings as a, as a kid at, uh, at the Johnny Oldwater drive-in in, uh, in Copeg. And, and every now and then when there was something that, that was playing up in, in Huntington on the Route, 10, uh, Route 110 drive-in, we, we would head up there. And then after, uh, after that one closed, 110 was... How many people remember the 110 drive-in? Yeah, well, those are the days. And, uh, and Copeg closed, and so... Route 110, it was, uh, that, that was one of the last uh, drive-in movie theaters on Long Island. And, and I'm a real cinema buff, as, uh, as, as those of you who, who read any of my books and, and, and listen to this talk will, um, will soon find out. So, so here I am, and I'm a professor of biology at uh, LIU Post, and I've been working as a research associate in residence at the American Museum of Natural History. And, and now I'm incredibly lucky that I get to write books, and I get to write, uh, as you'll see, um, fiction and nonfiction. I think it's on. My fault. Attention shoppers. <laughs> All right. My bad. How's that? OK. Well, that's a little bit better, I guess. All right, so so uh, so let's get started here. And 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 uh, and, and I was thrilled when, when, when Dylan in, invited me to, to come here, and, uh, and he said, you know, Bill, you can, you can, any book, any movie that you want, we can play. And I, I what, really? As, as long as it somehow ties into your book. And I wrote this uh, book that came out in February, um, Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History. And, uh, and this was the first movie that jumped to mind, which was a surprise to some of my friends and not to others. They were like, well, it must be Soylent Green, or maybe it's going to be The Silence of the Lambs, um, or, or even Psycho, which is my personal favorite film of all time. Uh, but I knew in my heart that it, that it was going to be the, the 1960 version of, uh, of um, the time machine. So, well, one of the questions that I get asked is, uh, is, is how do you come about writing a book about cannibalism? What is it that, 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 that you've got ingrained in you? And, um, and, and I, I always tell people that, you know, now it's social media. I, I hear from people that I haven't spoken to in 20, sometimes 30, maybe even 40 years. Uh, and they're like, so shut, what are you up to? And I'm like, well, let's see. I, um, I went to graduate school at Cornell and I studied vampire bats. And then I wrote my first book uh, on uh, blood feeding creatures and, the, and blood. Um, and uh, my first novel is about the crazy Nazi weaponry and giant vampire bats in Brazil. Um, and, uh, and now I'm writing a book about cannibalism. And they're like, well, that sounds about right. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so I was a kid, I grew up on Long Island, as I said, in Lindenhurst, and, and I was always turning over stones and logs and, and looking for salamanders and, uh, and fishing, and, and, um, and we'd go upstate, and so I spent a lot of time with nature, and, uh, and I've, I've developed a love for animals, and so, um, and, but I've always been sort of like a little bit on the, you know, into the weird stuff. When I, when I was a kid, I had a monkey, and my, my mother and I walked into Whites of Massapequa, uh, and, and walked out with a squirrel monkey and a cage for $29.99. <laughs> so my father, who was a milkman, comes home, and he's tired, it's probably 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and there in our living room is a monkey in a cage. Uh, so so just, uh, you know, just to show you how cool my parents were, instead of getting a little freaked out, they were like, my father looked at it and he goes, yeah, that cage is not going to work, it's way too small, you're going to have to build something bigger. And I went, all right. So I took my tape measure and I went down to 7-Eleven and I measured a phone booth and I came back with the, and I bought the wood, and I built a cage for a monkey in the middle of my living room in Lindenhurst, uh, the, the size of a phone booth. Yeah, so, and that's where, so that's where Googie lived for years and years. His name was Guggenheimer, named by my mom. Um, so, so, um, so, so these are, oh, well, back up. Uh, so these are a couple of the, of, of the books that, that I've, I've been working on. Um, my first book was Dark Banquet, about, and this was a, this, was sort of an offshoot of my work on vampire bats. The first, 
about the first third of the book, in a sense, wrote itself because it was work that I had been doing at, as a graduate student and then a postdoc and then as a researcher. Um, and so when the opportunity arose to write a book about blood feeding creatures, um, I just jumped all over that. And uh, what a surprise. Now, so what I realized that was out there was a lot of sensationalized stuff. And then there were some academic books out there. And there was really nothing in the middle. So what I tried to do with my first book, and now with, uh, with cannibalism, is to take a topic where uh, you have a knee-jerk reaction to it. If I say to you guys, cannibalism, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Don't think too much. First thing. Eating. Yeah. Eating. What else? Yuck. Yuck. <laughs> Donner Party. Donner Party. Anyone else? Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter. Jeffrey Dahmer. There is a knee-jerk reaction that we have to to the, term, to the word cannibalism. And, and I found that really interesting, and part of what I wanted to do was to, was to figure out um, why, why that was so. Uh, so that became a big part of the book. Of course, I wanted to look at this from a zoological perspective as well. Uh, and so there were some major surprises. Uh, in, when I was looking at it as, a, uh, as, as something, as a phenomenon that took place across the animal kingdom, but also when I took a look at it, uh, it with humans. You know, for example, I thought, when I got to, to the Donner Party, I figured, well, this has been done and done and done, and I probably will have a footnote or two, but there's been a lot of work done on this, and, and so I really am not going to need to cover it. Well, it lucked out because some major news was breaking about the Donner Party, and it had to do with the fact that there was no, uh, the, the headlines were stating that there was no cannibalism in the Donner Party, so I asked the researchers, was this true? And they said, no, the media messed this up. Yeah. Um, um, and then, so, so, so I found this whole new uh, bunch of information and, and, and worked with people who, who were figuring out all these neat things. Using uh, historical remains, historical human remains detecting dogs. They were calling them herd dogs. And I was like, what? And, and uh, to find bodies that were buried 170 years ago. Uh, so this was something that, that, that I found fascinating. And I was out there working with these people. So that turned into a really, a really kind of interesting story. Um, so, so the other thing that, got, that I got lucky about is that I got to, to, to write fiction. And so I was in the middle of uh, Brazil, in the Brazilian uh, plateau region, which not a lot of people go to. You know, they hear about the Amazon. But here's this 2,000-foot plateau in the middle of nowhere. And, and I said to myself and my friend who I went with, I said, you know something, if, I've always been a World War II buff. And I said, if, boy, if you were trying to hide something 70 years ago and you could bring it upriver, this would be the place to do it. So that's what I had my Nazis do. They brought up some of the, uh, of the rocketry uh, that was on the drawing board when World War II ended. Um, and, and, then, and, so I, and then I added, so, that, so our intrepid hero, McCready, who's now in this book that's coming out, the second book is coming out in, um, in, on June 6th. I had him going in there, and, um, and, and where, where the Allied and Axis forces meet, is below this plateau, and living up in the plateau are the last hundred prehistoric vampire bats. Picture a bat the size of a raccoon, oh. super intelligent. They actually live there, uh, and, and they're not happy about anyone being in the region. So that turned into Hell's Gate. Um, and so, and, and there's a, that, that's actually, that was declassified Luftwaffe um, plans for this rocket. So that's how I came to write a book about, uh, about cannibalism. Now, I'm also, as I mentioned, a serious, serious movie nut. And, um, and, and of course, how many people, ah, so I gave it away, of course. How many, how many people know what that comes from? Uh, oh, of course, I can't. All right, does anyone not know where that's from? Uh, and then, uh, well, the other, so that was a book that was, that was really significant when I, when I wrote this, and I'll, I'll give you a brief explanation for that, but I won't get into it too much. Um, and the other was The Time Machine. And eventually these two films got me thinking about real life cannibals associated with the fictional characters. So I don't know if you know this or not, but when you're talking about Psycho, uh, Robert Bloch, who wrote the novella for Psycho, took this from, uh, he took the story from a real life murderer, necrophile, cannibal, um, Ed Gein, in 1957 in, in, um, in Wisconsin. And, and Gein 
the, the crimes that he, that, that he committed were, were horrific, not, not the least of which was digging up bodies uh, and, uh, and, and kind of like the, in Psycho, taxidermying them. Um, but there was, there was also a cannibalistic aspect to what he did in his, his crimes. And, and when, when Blotch wrote the book, wrote his novella, he left out the cannibalism and stressed the mother fixation and the murder. And so did Hitchcock when Hitchcock bought the, uh, bought the rights to the book. And he sent his people out across the country to purchase every single copy of the book that they could find. And the reason for this was because they did not want, he, he did not want to give away the ending. So no one could find copies of this book that, and, and Blotch really made very, didn't make much money at, at all on this. It became sort of a, a, a sad story about, about the fact that here was Hitchcock's greatest masterpiece and, and the guy who wrote the story didn't see a lot. I, I think he made five, six thousand dollars total out of the, the entire deal. Um, the, other, um, the other movie that, that that I'm going to talk about is, is of course, H.G. Uh, Wells' uh, the story, The Time Machine. And, and I'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. Before I do, though, I, I, wanted to, um, I, I wanted to let you know, before we get into the stories like, uh, about the, the Time Machine and the, and the classic novel and this great movie that we'll be seeing tonight, um, I wanted to mention that my book does have aspects of, of human cannibalism in it. Um, and and I, I set out to write a book that was not sensationalistic. I, there was a bunch of sensationalized junk on one side, and there was academic stuff on the other. And I wanted to take this, this topic and make it into something, and demystify it, make it into something that, that a, a, the zoologist could look at, drop all of the jargon, uh, make it entertaining. So there's humor in the book where appropriate. You know, I realized that there's, that there's certainly human suffering that took place because of cannibalism in, in many of its forms. Uh, but also, as, a, as an educator, I've always found that the best way to, to, to get information across to an audience is to keep them entertained. They're not looking at their watches, or they're, you know, they're not kind of playing games on, the, on their phones. Um, and and so, so I tried to keep the tone light where, where possible. And so this is not a textbook by, by any stretch. So I tried to bring humor into it, and I, I, tried to, I, I tried to go into details about stories and aspects of cannibalism that you may never have heard about. That was interesting to me. Uh, for example, um, why do we, uh, you know, why do, why, where did, the, where did the, the taboo come from with regard to cannibalism? So I had a chapter that used to be called Blame It on the Greeks. And the, and the take home message is that if you go back 2,000 years and you look at Homer and then you move into the Romans and then you move into, into Shakespeare and the Brothers Grimm and Daniel Defoe, there, there was this snowball effect that started with the ancient Greeks that cannibalism was the absolute worst taboo that you could do. When Shakespeare wrote Titus Andronicus, that was the worst revenge that you could take on, on someone was to, uh, was, was to, in, in this instance, uh, the, you know, this guy winds up eating dinner and it's part of his kid, is, is what, is he, what he's eating, he doesn't realize it. Um, so, so from there, the early anthropologists picked this up and, uh, and, and it just went on and on and on to the point now where 2,000 years later, when I say the word cannibalism, you are completely repelled. And so that interested me. Where did this taboo come from? Um, I also was interested, really interested, in, in how the term, once it developed as this awful taboo, how it was used by the early explorers, uh, like Columbus and his pals, uh, in a sense as a weapon to bludgeon civilizations that they encountered. Because when Christopher Columbus came to the New World on his first voyage, his descriptions that went back to Queen Isabella, he described the people that he found, the indigenous people of the Caribbean, as being pleasant, as being, you know, you, these people are fit to become Christians. Uh, but then something strange happened, and that is he didn't find what he was looking for, and that was gold. And when he didn't find gold, he decided that he would have to figure out something else, another resource, and that resource became humans and human slavery. So um, with this cannibalism taboo in mind, Queen Isabella had told him, listen, if these people that you've met are, 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 are as nice as you say they are, then you can't enslave them. But if they're cannibals, then all bets are off. Now guess what? The second and third and fourth voyages to the New World that Columbus took were more like armed invasions. 
And and now by and now, and now guess what again? Uh, people who had previously been considered to be these kind people, welcoming, uh, uh, they were suddenly cannibals. So you could really, the, I mean, the atrocities that were committed against these people were, you know, were, were beyond horrific. Dogs tore them up. They were. It, it, think about what you would do if there was a pestilence and you were trying to get rid of, uh, you know, more like pest control uh, than anything else. And this idea of using cannibalism um, as a weapon moved from the from basically moved from the Caribbean into Mexico and then down into South America and then later into Africa when, when, when these so-called explorers moved into these regions. Now, with that said, um, well, first of all, I've got to back up and say, I'm not saying that cannibalism did not occur in these cultures because very likely it did. Now, you've got to understand that cultures that did not learn that cannibalism was the worst thing that you could possibly do, well, it might have been part of their culture. There were tribes, for example, in, in Brazil that were, when, when the anthropologists first met them, they were just as mortified to learn that the anthropologists buried their loved ones after they died as the anthropologists were mortified to learn that, the, that these, this group, the Waré, ate their dead. And the Waré were like, what, what do you mean you bury your dead? How could you do that? Do you let worms eat your loved ones? That's, that, that's disgusting. Um, so culture is king. That is really a take-home message in, in, in my book. It's, it's how you're brought up. It's, you know, if you're brought up that, that these rituals are not the worst taboo that you can inflict on someone else, then you're thinking about cannibalism in very different ways. So there was ritual cannibalism in the, in the Caribbean, probably a lot less than was portrayed elsewhere. Same thing. Um, I guess another take-home message from this book is that, yes, cannibalism has, happened, has, has occurred throughout history in ritualistic forms for, as a revenge, you know, um, uh, as, as a way, uh, there was culinary cannibalism, there was medicinal cannibalism, um, and rich, ritual cannibalism like funerary rites. Yes, it happened, but probably less, uh, uh, less examples of it than, uh, than, we, than we think. Um, and, and finally, the, the thing that fascinated me most out of all of the work that I did with human cannibalism was given this taboo, given this, this, the, the, the taboo that the Westerners had, the fact that in, in Europe, in many countries in Europe, for hundreds of years, starting in the Middle Ages, all through the Renaissance, and lasting right up until the beginning of the 20th century. Every type of body part that you can imagine, from bones like skulls and ground up bones, to fat and blood and viscera, were used as medicinal preparations and were taken in, and consumed by, the, by kings and commoners for hundreds of years to treat dozens and dozens of different maladies with the belief that they had some effect. And the worse, the more violent the death, the better off, the, the, the more medicinal value. And then they made this disappear. Because how many people have ever heard of this? Right. Well, that was, well, that was something that was a complete surprise to me. Um, and, and really the last vestiges of, of medicinal cannibalism are people who believe that by consuming their placenta, uh, after they give birth, um, they will get a medicinal benefit from it. Uh, in, you know, you have the baby blues where you have hormonal ups and downs and, 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 and postpartum depression. Uh, these folks believe that, this, that by consuming your own placenta, it somehow smooths out that, uh, that process. So of course I had to go down to Plano, Texas, uh, where I met up with someone who did this for a living. Her husband was a chef. He said, how do you want it, asobuco in a taco, or, or in a taco? And I said, well, I'm a half Italian, it's gotta be asobuco. So, um, yeah, so I, so I wound up uh, consuming placenta italiano uh, <laughs> by accident. I never thought I was going to do it. It just happened. You know, my semester had started. Here I am teaching at full time at Post, and I get this phone. You know, I get a phone call from this woman, and I'm, I thought I was going to interview her on maybe email, Skype. And she goes, oh, too bad. You could come down and eat my placenta. I just gave birth. And I went, what? Really? What? Is this woman asking me to? come to Texas to eat a placenta. And she was. She was, oh, my husband will cook it any way you want it. He had a chef's outfit on and a hat. Yeah, so, I went into, so I went into the liquor store, and I, I'm going, all right, we're going to find the most Texan-looking Texan, and I had to ask him about this pairing. So I've got... <laughs> yeah. The woman ran away. Well, so I found a nice bottle of Italian red, and the rest is history. All right, so that's, but that, that's really not what, that's not where we're going here tonight. I, I need to move on. My, my wife's going to be going in a minute. So I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you before uh, uh, about something else here. Um, 
Yeah, but those of you who are going time machine and what's he talking about? What's the connection here? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, that we'll be able to figure this this out. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, when I think of it, I'll let you know. There is somehow a connection. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's it's cannibalism in the animal kingdom, and uh, and and um, before I get into the in, into the specifics of this, one of the things that that I learned when I when I started to work on uh, the, that I was determined to do this survey of cannibalism throughout the animal kingdom, um, one of the things that I found first off was that the, the old scientific party line, which had been up until really recently, was that except for a couple of weirdos like the praying mantis and the black widow spider, which were certainly cannibals, and everybody knew that because it was in all of this literature, that cannibalism in the animal kingdom would be an unnatural act that would occur in instances where where there was no food, or second, when there was a captive condition, when you took a bunch of animals and stuck them in, a, uh, in an area that was not large enough, and then they acted abnormally. Uh, well, that turned out to be not the case at, at, at all. Um, so, but when you talk about praying mantises, um, this, is what, you know, this is one of the two famous animal cannibals. And in reality, they're not as cannibalistic as, you would, as it would seem. And it doesn't really have when you see cannibalism like this, the, this kind of uh, sexual cannibalism, it's not really related to male-female. It's related to size. Now, in this instance, the, uh, the, the, the female is much larger than the male. And, um, and, and what he gets out of this deal is, and, and, and then there are instances where the male gets killed, gets eaten. Uh, but what happens here is that, um, that he is not only providing his sperm, and so, so, so basically the genetic material for the next generation, but providing his mate with a meal uh, so she gets healthier, lays more eggs, uh, and, and, the, and females who consume their mates are much less likely to mate again. So it is a, it is a serious uh, reproductive strategy for the male, who's probably going to die soon anyway and is not going to run into another female. So this is a way to sort of like ensure that the next generation uh, carries on your, uh, your genes. Um, but what I also found out, and, and this is a, at some point going to tie into the time machine, uh, is that uh, it, it does, believe me. Um, is basically that, that, that cannibalism is employed as, as, a, as a form of parental care. It's a reproductive strategy, as you just saw here. And it's also a hedge against, uh, against environmental conditions that may, uh, that may be changing or, or, or unpredictable. Now, about the Black Widow, <clears throat> sorry to let you guys down, but Black Widow spiders are not all that cannibalistic. There have been instances, but the, but the, but the studies that show that, that, that that uh, black widow spiders were cannibals were done in captive conditions where they starved the female. So there are just as many instances where the male will live in the nest for weeks after he mates and never gets eaten. Uh, but, but if you want to see cannibalism in a, in a relative of the uh, black widow spider, uh, we have the Australian redback here, uh, which is a spectacular uh, ex example. Um, and here you can see how they, uh, how the, how they make. Well, there's the male. So when they are getting ready to, to, to mate, what you need to picture is that the male is about the size of your favorite throw pillow. Uh, and, and, and they start to mate face to face here. Um, and then the, the male does, and, and he's transferring a blob of, of, of sperm that's wrapped up in a web uh, because they don't have penises. So he's just in, he's basically, ooh, he's just inserting this, um, this, this uh, sperm web. Uh, and that's how the female gets pregnant. But in this instance, something kind of strange happens. Not that that wasn't strange, right? Uh, he does, instead of wandering off, he does a somersault that winds up placing his abdomen next to the female's mouth. And what does she do to reciprocate? She ch starts to eat his abdomen. And he crawls off uh, and then sort of tries to straighten himself back out. Uh, and then he crawls back into the fray again, delivers another dose of, of sperm, um, and then she wraps him up and, and consumes him. And as I said, yeah. So, so, so the, the, the take home message here is that, that once again, the female gets a meal out of this, she's less apt to mate again, and she produces more eggs than would normally be, uh, be expected. Okay, so this was my lousy slide. I'm so, uh, here, here's an example of, um, of, of, um, of cannibalism as parental care. And there are things called trophic eggs. And, and, and we would call them kids' meals. 
So, there are, let's, so let's say a spider lays 600 eggs. Maybe 15 of them are going to hatch into spiderlings. The other, do the math. Yes, good, all right. Um, so all of the other eggs are consumed. They're never going to hatch. They are, in a sense, kids' meals. And they are doled out to the babies. In this instance, we're talking about the black lace weaver spider. Um, and, once, and, and I'm sorry for this. What got transferred over here was a thumbnail instead of a really wonderful uh, photo, uh, figure like this from my friend Patricia Wynn. Um, and once these eggs are consumed and the, and the spiderlings get a little bit bigger uh, and there are no more eggs left, what will happen is that the, that the female will sort of hunker down. She'll drum her pedipalps on the ground, call her babies into her, and they will consume her. Uh, and they don't chew her or pull her apart. They literally, it, it's kind of like it, 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 they snork her up like a spider-flavored Slurpee. So yeah, they, they sort of pierce her body and then and drop some enzymes in and just suck up the liquid. Yeah, uh, there'll be people walking out of here soon, probably. <laughs> no, the time machine, I just saw that last week. We don't need to see that again, huh? Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and down here, the, uh, the, the reason I'm showing this is because uh, there are snails that do the same thing. They lay these trophic eggs. What I thought was wild when I figured, when I ran into this one is that these, uh, these snails, which are hermaphroditic, will shoot these darts at each other, love darts. Mm. Um, and, and this is, we believe, the origin of the Cupid myth. Because the Greeks and then the Romans after them, you know, it's Eros and then Cupid, um, saw these snails uh, dur while they were mating, shooting uh, darts at each other. And from that, then it went to arrows with Cupid. Um, but the, the, they are cannibals as well, since they'll take a bite out of each other while they're mating. So there is that going on. All right, so, so, so this, this is my favorite. And, uh, and this is a group of, of amphibians that really nobody's heard about. They're called the Sicilians. And I always have to clear that with my relatives. I'm like, they're like, what, Billy? What? Like, no, it's, just, it's Sicilian with a C, Grim. It's not, there's no, the S is no. Um, and, and so what happens here is this. You have two groups of these. One, one group lays eggs. The other group doesn't lay eggs. But what researchers found was this. And, and to me, this was the coolest example in all of nature. Um, these are the egg layers, and it was, repeat, it was reported that when the eggs hatch, that the, that the babies will squirm around their mother and just kind of squirm around her body for several weeks. And someone took a closer look at it, and what they realized was that they weren't just squirming around her body, they were peeling her skin and eating it. So someone took a look at this and they went, well, is that odd behavior? No, it wasn't, because when you look at the skin, instead of the skin like we would have, you know, dead skin on the outside, this was fat rich, nutrient rich. This was an, this had evolved as a form of parental care. So the skin gets peeled and eaten. It's the only thing that the babies eat. It grows back again really quickly. Uh, and, and then a couple of weeks later, the babies move along on their way. Now, so someone took a look at the live bearer. So they give birth to live young. And they said, well, when the babies are born, they're born with this weird little tooth. What, what is that about? And, th and before they could figure it out, they thought, well, maybe it's scra scraping algae because that's what they were eating when they, when they, after they hatch. And then the tooth fell out. So they started to di so they dissected some females that had recently given birth, and they found out that the lining of the oviduct, where these babies developed inside their moms, the lining in the regions where the babies were developing was gone, that the babies were eating, consuming the lining of the oviductal lining. Um, and doing it in sort of in a similar fashion uh, to, to what you see in these guys. So to me, that was, I couldn't get enough of that. I thought, I thought it was the most fantastic thing ever. The most fantastic thing ever. All right, so I have to give my local example before we move on to the real stuff here. Uh, and that is the, the sand tiger shark. Local waters to the Great South Bay. Um, this is a shark that, uh, that is, to me, fascinating for the, for the, the, the form of cannibalism that it, that, that it undergoes is called sibling cannibalism or adelphophagy. And what happens is this. This is not an odd behavior that, that this is a, a, a type of shark where the, the eggs are, are retained inside the female and they hatch inside the female. And then the babies are born alive. So there's no placenta or anything like that, but it's kind of like keeping your eggs inside you and then, and, and then they hatch and then you're, and, and you're born. What happens here is that the eggs are, are laid at different times, are, are, are produced at different times. So you have older eggs and you have eggs that are, that, that are younger eggs. Well, the first two, and there's two oviducts, there's a right side and a left side. The first two 
babies to hatch are, of course, the largest, and they start to eat the eggs. And when they get done with the eggs, eggs start to hatch, and they start to eat their brethren. So that when they're born, there are only two sharks, one that's come out the right side, one that's come out the left side, and these sharks are now pre-adapted to be predators. They've literally been hunting before they're born. Local species. I thought this, I, this to me was, see, that's what this book is about. It's not, you know, you're not going to find uh, Jeffrey Dahmer stories in here, or, 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 you know, I tried to stay away from the sort of sensational and tell these interesting tales. All right, so, all right, finally, let's, uh, let's get to, um, the, this, this to me is one of the most interesting examples of animal cannibalism. Uh, it led me to the Chiricahua Mountains, a border in Arizona and New Mexico, and it was there uh, that I found the connection to the time machine. All right, well, this is a spadefoot toad. There are three species that live in, uh, uh, that live in the region, and they're kind of, uh, they're not, very, they're not really spectacular, but you know, they're kind of cool looking. And, and, and here's me, this, once again, this artwork done by Patricia Wynn. And I'm, um, I'm, I'm in one of these uh, uh, ponds that, uh, that, that I was working in Arizona, um, that w where, where the toads lay their eggs. And um, this is, these animals are just like any other toad. They, the, the eggs are laid in a mass. They'll turn into salamander, uh, in, excuse me, they'll turn into tadpoles. Then, then they'll sprout legs, the tail will start to dissolve, they'll crawl out on land, and then they'll hop away. But, but the key here is that they, they have a period of time where they need to be in the water as they develop. And, you know, so so that's, uh, that's, an, that's really a, uh, an important factor here. Now, what I discovered, and, and what people have been working on now for 15 years or so, is the fact that when you look at these, when you go into the pond, and so here I am um, uh, netting these animals, when, when you look at them up close, you see this remarkable difference, that half of them are normal size, and they feed on, uh, on algae, or stuff that's floating around in the water. They've got a really long digestive tract, which means that they're eating plant material. You, know, you want to look at an herbivore's uh, digestive tract, it's going to be extremely long, because it's difficult to break plant down. Um, now, there's the other half of them, and these are, these are e eggs that have, th this is the same batch of eggs. When you look at these, they're, they're three, four times larger than the smaller versions. They've got a set of choppers that reminded me of uh, jack-o'-lantern. Extremely large jaw muscles and a very short gut. Now, if you're a, a, a mammologist like I am, when you, look at, when you see something with a short gut, the, the first thing that, that jumps into your mind is that this is a meat eater. This is a carnivore. And indeed, what is taking place here is that this morph, this alternate body shape, um, is feeding on, the, um, is feeding on, the, um, on the, the smaller version, the, the, the herbivore. So that phenomenon um, is known to biologists as, and I'm going to drop a big word on you here, but it's an important word with regard to the time machine, phenotypic plasticity. And phenotypic plasticity is defined as when changing environmental conditions allow multiple phenotypes. And when I say phenotype, just think of the way animals look, the outward appearance. So allow, when, when changing environmental conditions allow multiple phenotypes that arise from a single genotype, and by that I mean so that these two morphs arise from a single genetic blueprint. There's not this kind of weird blueprint for large toads and, and a normal blueprint for small toads. It's a single genetic blueprint that's used. Um, and, and the reason that this occurs um, is because of something in the environment. Some type of, something in the environment is driving this, which defines it as, a, as, as phenotypic plasticity. So there's an environmental condition here that is causing th these two um, morphs to take place. Now, what is that environmental condition? And here you can see the cannibalism taking place. So, when they told me that I was going to be working in ponds, I thought, okay, you know, Argyle Lake, it's going to do a Belmont pond. Now, so we're talking about something that looks like, the, like some of these ponds look like a, a truck tire had spun out and then it rained. <laughs> so, and, and all of them, some of them were larger, of course, but all of them had 
eggs in them, all of them that the toads were using. And what's taking place here is this, that these ponds in this extremely arid, very, very hot region can dry up overnight. Now, if, if this pond dries up overnight and all of the tadpoles, none of the, and none of the tadpoles have gotten out of the pool yet, then everybody's dead. So the environmental factor here is, is, the, the, is the unreliability of, 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 the, of the body of water that you've laid your eggs in. So that is the trigger, in a sense, what led to the evolution of this phenomenon where some of the tadpoles explode in size, consume their brethren, develop quicker in about two-thirds the time, and then can develop legs and get out of the pool. So they are, in a sense, responding to, the, to, the, to, the, to, these, uh, to these environmental conditions that are certainly not predictable. And, and in a sense, as long as, as, as a couple of days have gone by, at least some of these animals, in theory, are going to survive. So that's, um, that's phenotypic plasticity. Now, something happens very much like that in a... Uh, Another Long Islander, and that is the tiger salamander. Anybody, anybody ever see these? They're big, spectacular animals. They're, they're black with, with yellow uh, blotches. They're really, the, they get to be up to 13 inches long. It's the largest terrestrial salamander in the United States. Um, and really an impressive creatures. Um, now, and, and you'll see them by golf courses uh, at the end of the winter or towards the very early spring, and they'll be crossing over roads to lay their eggs which are late in late winter, early spring. And, and usually when the babies hatch, they are going to be herbivores. They'll eat algae, etc. They'll eat uh, detritus. They'll eat microinvertebrates. Uh, but some of them, in some instances, will pop these huge jaws, large muscles, massive teeth, and they will cannibalize their, uh, their, their brethren. So that got me thinking. That got me thinking. And, and so I want, to, I want to read you the, the connection here between what we just saw here uh, and, and the time machine. I wondered whether H.G. Wells knew about cannibal morphs among creatures like salamanders and toads when he wrote The Time Machine in 1895. In Wells' classic story, the time traveler encounters two human species, a child-sized and docile Eloy and the brutish Morlocks, who raised the Eloi in order to feed upon them. I'm sorry if I gave a spoiler here for those of you who have never seen it. Um, Wells explained that the Morlocks' cannibalistic behavior uh, was caused by the fact that, that they were once workers, uh, members of a working class, toiling underground for lazy, upper-class surface dwellers. The time traveler speculates that a food shortage, now there's the environmental change that we're talking about here, forced the subterraneans to alter their diets. At first, rats, but ultimately something a bit larger. Eventually, this behavior resulted in a race of hulking cannibals feeding on the surface dwellers whose own evolutionary path would produce the sheep-like Eloi, pampered, well-fed, and ultimately slaughtered for food. Although the Eloy Morlock relationship was clearly meant to serve as a cautionary tale of the horrors of class distinction, H.G. Wells imagined a biological phenomenon remarkably similar to what scientists are working at on today. Researchers now believe that phenotypic, phenotypic plasticity offers the perfect, perfect building blocks for the type of evolutionary change described by Wells a century ago. These building blocks could be novel traits, like the, tal like the sal tiger salamander's kin-chomping jaws, or the spade foot toad's serrated beak, each having originated in an environment, each having originated as an environment-dependent alternative to an already established trait. In this case, normal jaws. What these scientists now hypothesize goes far beyond the realm of cannibalism into the very mechanisms of evolution itself. Their claim is that the appearance of new traits in a population, generally regarded as a first step towards the evolution of a new species, can occur by means other 
than the slow accumulation of micro mutations. Generally speaking, we believe that things evolve with, uh, with a, an accumulation of small changes that, that happen over time. What they're saying here is that perhaps this type of phenotypic uh, uh, plasticity, if you got a, let's say you had a cannibalistic, a large cannibalistic salamander or a large cannibalistic toad or a group of humans that were living underground, if at this point, if, let's go back to the salamanders and, and toads, if, if instead of if, if those animals kept those traits, big jaws, big body, and were reproductively active, if they were reproductively mature, then in a sense they could produce a generation of large cannibalistic creatures. Does, does, that, does that make sense? This is very different than, than you would think that evolution normally works. Um, so, so there's a whole um, science now called EVO-DEVO, Developmental Evolutionary Biology, that, that looks at the fact that, that evolution may occur in big steps in some instances. And this would be an example of, of, how, that, of, of how that could happen. So in Wells' story, it's, uh, it's, it's the Morlocks. In nature, uh, perhaps it's a, a new species of, uh, of salamander or, or, um, or, or toad. Okay, and here we go. Uh, there's a there's a, there's our Eloy, and the, there is the there's a our Moloch. Right here. Oh, there are equivalents in nature. All right, so I'm going to wrap this up, um, and th this is kind of a strange one because I usually talk a, more, a lot more about uh, about human cannibalism, but not tonight because we want to get to this amazingly cool movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so. These are the conclusions. These are some of the major conclusions that I came to when looking at when, when looking at this. It's extremely commonplace um, in nature. It occurs in some groups more than others. In, in animals that lay a lot of eggs, that you get a lot of cannibalism. Uh, when you get into, say, the primates and animals that, that produce very few young, not so much cannibalism, only in extreme circumstances. Um, and the functions of cannibalism are, go far beyond what we normally think about. Uh, you know, it's not just we ran out of food. It can be used as foraging behavior. When a codfish lays a million eggs and, and eats some of them, she's not looking at Tony and Sally. It, it's, it's more like eating, looking at a handful of raisins. There's no individual recognition of these. It's, it's food. Um, so, and, okay, so, so the foraging behavior, parental care, which we talked about, mate selection. Um, a, a chimpanzee ba a mother who brings a baby into a new group uh, is going to care for that baby for several years and not come into estrus, not available for mating. What will happen is that the lead male will murder that, that, that baby uh, and, and sometimes eat it, uh, and then that female will come into estrus much quicker. So there's a reproductive strategy based on cannibalism. It has nothing to do with a lack of food. Um, and then the, the one that, that ties in, in my mind, um, with, the, with the Eloy and Morlock story is this whole idea of, of cannibalism as a way to cope with, um, with stressful environmental conditions, whether it be uh, you know, living subterraneally uh, and then trying to find another food source, or um, living in a, in a pond that may dry up tomorrow if you haven't uh, uh, developed and, and climbed out of the water. So um, the wonderful artwork in this book and in all of my books and in every paper I've ever written and every book chapter and, and is, is all done by Patricia Wynn, a, a, a very famous and, and incredibly talented artist. I want to thank the LIU and the American Museum of Natural History. And of course, I, I'd like to thank uh, Dylan and, and Ryan and, and the staff of the Cinema Arts Center. And uh, thanks for, for hearing me out. Um, so there's, there's my website. Uh, there's Facebook, Twitter, and you can find this where, wherever books are sold. The, the, yeah. The Himalayan Codex is, is going to be out on June 6th. That's the, it's a standalone novel that's going to follow Hell's Gate. It's a completely different uh, story. You could start with either one of them. And, and Hell's Gate is out there in, in paperback right now. Uh, so I'll be around to sign books later, and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Thanks. Um, 
spent months at Caracas uh, with Vyasa. And one weekend, one of the guys says, uh, why don't we, would you like to go to Canaima for the weekend? And Canaima is like this primitive paradise right on the Venezuelan-Brazilian border, deep in the jungle. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous place. So the next day we got up and said, hey, there's a, um, a, a little village not too far from here. Let's go see. But uh, these guys used to be cannibals. So I said, used to be cannibals? Uh, that long ago. <laughs> not that long ago. So I'm thinking like Michael Rockefeller and all this kind of stuff. So we trekked through the, oh, the first thing we did on the, on the this is only 30 miles from Angel's Falls. We hopped in the plane and did a fly by Angel's Falls about three or four times and the, the wingtip almost touched. It was just amazing. So it, it, we, we trekked through the jungle for about three hours, not, not knowing what I'm going to see. And we finally came to the settlement and a bunch of buildings and a big building. and walked in there and these cannibals were playing air hockey. <laughs> yeah, well, they had been completely, um, not completely, but yeah, civilized. So was there, was there any proof that these were actual cannibals? Um, they actually, in a very remote place, not that many tourists would come there, but they actually put on a little show, kind of, about their history. And... Uh, that part of it? There were lots of stories about uh, that tribe of people, you know, up until the 60s, I think, or the 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, um, I, I think the any groups that that had maintained ritual cannibalism, a lot of that now is either gone because of the mainly because of the Western influence. You don't want to get the guys who hand out the T-shirts mad at you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are um, if, if you are doing these these rituals, you're doing them either in secret or you're not doing it anymore. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Anyone else have a question or? Oh. Well, one question about your book cover: that plateau is that Roy Rama, or is that something that's? Related? Yeah, that's not, that. That is not um, uh, the the plateau from Central Brazil. It is, in fact. From Venezuela, so uh, that was that was somebody that in the um, in the in the art department who decided that that was a cool looking shot, so they put that on there rather than uh, uh, rather than the central mastiff in, in, in Brazil. I thought it was a great shot, you know, smoke all around it. And the other thing is just a, a weird bit of Rod Taylor trivia. There's another film I always associate with him, also from the '60s, Got it. and there's a the scene when he's speaking to the World War I Philby, the son, and he says, my father never liquidated the house. There's a Rod Taylor film called The Liquidator, oh, which was a spy film huh. that has a fantastic theme sung by Shirley Bassey. It's like a Goldfinger thing. Huh. And it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, that one I'm not familiar with. I thought you were going to talk about The Birds, which is this other great film. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, it's called The Liquidator. And huh. It's really I'll have to check that very out. cinematic, worth checking out. Anyone else? So, what was your impression seeing the film again? Oh, I love it. I mean, it's you know, you know, what was interesting to me. I was afraid. I, I just got it on the and then I and, and watched it. Again. Yeah, the, 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 the backdrop.